Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here, and thank you for uh, providing the opportunity for me to speak to you. Today, Ralph and I are going to present information about the 2021 crayfish research conducted by USGS and our collaborators. Although there are only three authors listed on this talk, the reality is that in order to get to the point where we actually had something to present, um, we required the input and help of many, many people. On this slide, I show the topics for today's talk. I'll be covering the summary of the 2021 standard crayfish sampling, as well as the results of that sampling. And Ralph will be covering a summary in the results of the spring 21 bottom trawl survey, as well as the plans for the 2022 bottom trawl survey. First, I'd like to cover a summary of the 2021 standard crayfish sampling. USGS typically reports on two lake-wide crayfish surveys each year, a bottom trawl survey and an acoustic survey. As usual, the acoustic survey was a collaboration among three different agencies, including U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Michigan DNR, and USGS. The effort levels for the acoustic survey were similar to prior years, and this survey still represents one of the two largest freshwater acoustic surveys in the world, with the other one being uh, Lake Huron. We aged approximately 250 alewife for, from the acoustic survey. The bottom trawl survey this year was carried out at historic sites, plus some additional sites in deeper water that hadn't been part of the long-term time series. New trawl monitoring sensors were used to improve the ability to measure time on bottom which should improve density estimation. And more than 300 alewife were aged from bottom trawl catches. A total of nearly 600 alewife were aged for age composition purposes uh, for 2021. This map shows the locations of the sampling that was conducted in 2021. The blue squares represent the locations of the acoustic sampling. The orange circles represent the locations of the bottom trawl sampling, and the magenta triangles represent the locations of midwater trawl sampling. Next, I'd like to present the results of the 2021 lakewide surveys. I'll be presenting the results for species caught in both surveys on the same graphs, while species that are caught in the bottom trawl only will be in separate graphs. This slide shows the biomass density for adult alewife in the left panel and numeric density for young of year alewife in the right panel. The black line is for the bottom trawl survey and the blue line is for the acoustic survey. The slides that have graphs showing data from both surveys will be structured this way uh, for bloater and for smelt as well. Adult alewife biomass density from the bottom trawl survey was well below the long-term mean, but in the acoustic survey, the estimate was 80% of the acoustic survey long-term mean. Young of your alewife density from the acoustic survey was only 22% of the long-term mean, indicating that it was a relatively poor year class in 2021. We only show the young of your alewife from the acoustic survey because we really don't believe that the bottom trawl survey provides us a valuable index for young of your alewife. This plot shows the length and age composition of the alewife catch in the two annual surveys. The midwater trawl data are in the upper panel and the bottom trawl data are shown in the lower panel. The coloration of the bars represents the age composition of that 10 millimeter length category. As is typical, the midwater trawl captures alewife smaller than from bottom trawling. Both surveys show a relatively high contribution from the 2020 alewife year class. And both surveys continue to show a truncated age distribution with a maximum age being six and most fish 
being from the 2018 and later year classes. On this slide, you can see maps of ale life density in the lake. On the left shows uh, adult ale life, and on the right, young of year ale life. Adult ale life were observed throughout most of the lake, but high densities were observed in very few locations. Young of year ale life were also observed throughout most of the lake, but the highest densities were observed in the south or southeast portion of the lake. The next two slides will be about bloater. Both surveys suggest that the biomass density of adult bloater that's shown in the left panel is much less than it was in the 1980s and 1990s, but the acoustic survey indicates that there is an increasing trend since 2016. The bottom trawl density of young of year bloater shown in the right panel is also much lower than in the 1980s and 1990s. However, the acoustic survey, we saw the largest year class observed in the time series and a higher density than the peak in the bottom trawl in the 1980s. This map shows the density of bloater. You can see on the left hand, again, adults um, were only observed at high densities at um, a few locations outside of the southeast portion of the lake, uh, more or less off the Door Peninsula. There were regular or consistent high densities in the southeastern portion of the lake. That is more or less true of the Young of Year bloater as well, the highest densities typically being observed in the southeast portion of the lake. The next two slides will cover rainbow smelt. Adult rainbow smelt continued to be present at densities much lower than in the first 20 years of the bottom trial survey and the first few years of the acoustic survey. It was a similar result for young of year smelt. However, the density for young of year smelt in the acoustic survey was the highest that we've observed since 2009. Adult rainbow smelt shown in the left map were observed at relatively few locations with high densities near the upper peninsula, but not really anywhere else. The young of deer smelt were more widespread, but they're still limited in density and distribution compared to historical conditions. The next two slides will be species that are only captured in the bottom trawl. First is nine spine stickleback and round goby. Nine spine stickleback density in 2021 continued a pattern of very low levels that have been observed since 2008. However, round goby density in 21 was similar to the mean of the years 2003 to 2019. Finally, we arrived at a slide about bottom trawl data for two important native species, slimy and deepwater sculpins. Slimy sculpin density remained low in 2021, continuing at a level similar to that in the years 2012 to 2019. Deepwater sculpin's density, which has typically been an order of magnitude higher than for slimy sculpin, remained low relative to the years prior to 2008. Next, I'll turn it over to Ralph who will provide a summary and results of the spring 2020 bottom trawl survey, as well as plans for the 2022 spring survey. Great, thanks Dave, and thanks to everyone else for joining today. Uh, so the spring forage assessment could best be considered a complementary survey to our fall forage assessment that's conducted each year and that Dave talked about earlier today. Uh, this is because we're using similar gear over similar areas of Lake Michigan to try to address our first objective, uh, which is to compare spring versus fall ill life and goby indices. And really, this is nested in the idea that we've seen historically low values in the bottom trawl since 2014 and a discrepancy between uh, ill life biomass between the bottom trawl and the acoustic survey since that time. Uh, secondly, uh, we're looking to determine if yearling cisco and lake whitefish could be indexed using a spring bottom trawl. So uh, we had initially planned to sample uh, over six transects on Lake Michigan in 2021. 
Unfortunately, due to poor weather as well as bad uh, vessel luck, we had to shorten to three transects that were sampled in uh, late April. Uh, uh, these occurred off the coasts of Frankfurt, Ludington, and Saugatuck. At these prioritized transects, uh, we sampled some sites that are commonly sampled in the fall, shown here by uh, black dots. And additionally, we sampled out to 225 meters at 11 new sites. And the goal here was to try to capture alewife, uh, potentially while they're aggregated in overwintering habitats uh, in the early spring prior to moving inshore and up in the water column. So jumping right into what we saw in the trawl, um, total catch was um, predominantly bloater, so over half of the catch was bloater. And then we saw about equal representation of goby, deep water scope, and, and alewife. Um, beyond these uh, four species, we also saw some slimy sculpin and two smelt, so not well represented in the survey. Um, we also did not observe any juvenile cisco or lake whitefish. So uh, regarding objective two, based on this limited data set, um, the bottom trawl doesn't seem to be effective uh, for indexing this species. Other species caught in the trawl included lake trout, burbot, lake sturgeon, and adult lake whitefish. So for this talk, we're going to focus largely on alewife, given it's the um, primary species of interest collected in the spring trawl. Um, in terms of spatial distribution, alewife were caught across all three transects. Um, and in fact, they were actually only caught at depths greater than or equal to 110 meters. Um, the largest catches for small alewife, or those less than 120 millimeters, uh, actually occurred off the coast of Saugatuck at our deepest site and at a highest value of 9.91 kilograms per hectare. Um, however, we did have several catches at other transects that were above one kilogram per hectare um, at all three of these locations. For larger alewife, or those greater than 120 millimeters, um, things were a bit more patchy. We really only had one very high catch of these individuals, and this was at very deep site off of Saugatuck. Um, and the total was 14.6 kilograms per hectare. Uh, we also note that there were actually no uh, large alewife caught off of Frankfurt. Thinking more about the depth distribution of alewife, uh, we can see here that for all sites, biomass tended to peak around 140 to 160 meters in depth. Um, so this would suggest to us that alewife at this time of the year, so this mid to late April period, are still aggregated in deep overwintering habitats on Lake Michigan. And we do note that this was a relatively warm year um, and they still appear to be in these habitats. Um, and these patterns do align with some of the sparse data we have from the 2000s on Lake Michigan, but they differ from historical uh, distributions of alewife in the spring. So in a recent analysis uh, conducted here at the Great Lakes Science Center, we saw that from 1960s to the 1990s, uh, alewife by mid-April tended to be moving into shallower habitats on Lake Michigan. Um, so under current conditions, they seem to be staying out deeper longer. Interestingly enough, and as noted by the red lines on this plot, um, our depth distribution of alewife in the spring aligns with what's observed on Lake Ontario in their spring survey uh, that's used to index yearling and age two plus fish. So as I mentioned earlier, um, small alewife were well represented in the spring survey this year. And when we actually looked at the age for uh, 259 individuals and extrapolated an age length key out across our catch, um, what we can see is that yearling were the predominant age class, those 2020 fish um, in our sample. Um, we also note that we did not observe any fish over age six and the vast majority were age four or younger. Um, so this, there's, this is important for two reasons. Uh, first, um, we still see this age truncation in the alewife on Lake Michigan that's also been observed in the hydroacoustic survey and the fall bottom trawl. Uh, and secondly, the predominance of yearling fish may indicate that the spring survey could be useful as an index of recruitment strength uh, in a way that's very similar to how it's used on Lake Ontario. So returning to objective one, uh, where we want to compare fall and spring indices for prey fishes, most notably alewife, uh, we took several approaches. Uh, the first was to compare yearling and older biomass uh, from the spring in 2021 to that value generated in the fall. Um, so we used the same approach of weighted mean density um, based on depth strata, but I extended it out to 167 meters in the spring given the uh, high densities we observed at greater depths. When we compare these two values across seasons, uh, we can see that the spring is more than double the value of the fall, 1.38 kilograms per hectare versus half a kilogram. 
Um, notably, this value is actually still quite a bit lower um, than any value reported prior to 2000 for alewife biomass in the fall. Um, also, this higher value in the spring isn't that surprising given our recent historical analysis um, in which we noted that overall spring biomass density for alewife tends to be slightly higher than the fall. Another approach that we took was to compare uh, metrics that could be generated using the spring survey to recent history or the recent fall uh, time series from 2004 to 2019. Uh, and this represents the period we have both the acoustic survey and the bottom trawl. So on the left, we're showing um, age zero fish from the acoustic survey and the fall bottom trawl uh, that was recalculated for only the three ports sampled in the spring versus the yearling estimate from 2021 that's shown in red here. Um, and essentially the take home point is uh, we can capture this year class potentially better in the spring than we can in the fall, given the higher estimates of yearling fish in the spring survey versus anything sampled in the bottom trawl for age zero fish. Um, and then on the right, we have yearling and older fish from the acoustic survey and from the bottom trawl extending back to 2004 uh, versus age two plus fish in the spring. And essentially, it's the same story that we see when comparing this yearling and older biomass from the spring to the fall in 2021, where we have slightly higher values than has been observed in the bottom trawl in recent years, um, but still lower than most years for the acoustic survey and not dramatically higher uh, or anything that would indicate we are um, drastically underrepresenting alewife biomass density in the other two surveys. So what did we learn in the spring of 2021? Uh, first, that fish appear to be aggregated in those overwintering habitats through late April. Um, and this aligns with the depth distributions that have been observed in Lake Ontario. We still see evidence of age truncation uh, for alewife with no individuals greater than age six captured. Um, we also note that the age two plus biomass density estimates um, that were calculated from the spring are higher than recent fall yearling and older estimates. But this aligns with our understanding of of uh, density estimates between seasons on Lake Michigan. And finally, uh, we see that yearling density estimates were much higher than recent fall age zero values in the spring survey. And this avenue might be uh, useful in exploring more to think about an additional metric of recruitment strength uh, from this spring survey. And with that, I just wanted to close on our plans for the 2022 assessment in the spring. Uh, we're going to expand to the six ports that were originally planned in 2021, limiting our sites below 110 meters given the small number of fish captured and expanding those in deeper waters. And our main goals here are to confirm the patterns that were observed in 2021, um, while also filling in the gaps in depth distribution uh, so we can plan more efficient surveys in the future and limit how far out we go into Lake Michigan uh, during the spring. And with that, uh, thanks for listening and Dave and I can try to answer any questions you have.